One of the most requested tutorials on our forum has been for techniques to populate supermarket shelves. Specifically, users are interested in how to randomise the number of products on the shelf in depth and also to be able to create patterns of grouped items. In this video, we'll illustrate a couple of tips for achieving these effects and then we'll expand the idea and demonstrate how to use nested objects and a built-in macro to stack objects on top of one another. First of all, we'll look at how to prepare geometry. To populate shelves, the chances are that you're going to need quite a few product models. We've supplied three in this tutorial, but in reality you'll need many more. They may not all come from the same source and they'll almost certainly have individual materials. To make them work well with RailClone, the following changes are recommended. First of all, we need to generate a multi-sub material for all of the objects. This is because, unlike Forest Pack, RailClone doesn't automatically consolidate materials and reassign IDs automatically. Instead, you need to create a multi-sub object material that uses the same material IDs as set on the source geometry, basically so that the same material applied to both RailClone object and the individual components gives you the same results. An easy way to consolidate materials from different sources is to attach all the objects into a single mesh. Just use the default options and Max will create the multi-sub object material automatically. Once this is done and they're all attached, simply detach them again back into separate objects. You may also find there are some scripts that can make a multi-sub object material for you. For example, I use Wrapper Tools which has a multi-material from selection option. Ok, so secondly, orientation is also important. It's much easier to design your style if all the object's transforms are aligned in the same way before adding them to RailClone. For these styles, we would rotate the objects, imagining that the world's x-axis describes the front of the shelf. Once all the objects are correctly rotated, reset the x-form to align the object's pivot points and bounding boxes with the world coordinate system, and also to make sure there are no sneaky, non-uniform scale issues. Later in this tutorial, we'll be using some macros to automatically distribute and stack objects. The macro is expecting the pivot points to be centred on the bottom of the objects. So to do this, just go to the hierarchy panel and turn on Effect Pivot Only. Then press Alignment Centred Object and move the pivot to the bottom of the objects before turning off Effect Pivot Only. There are also several scripts that can do all this for you automatically, but once again, I personally use Wrapper Tools. With our geometry prepared, we're ready to start building the first style. In this example, we'll populate shelves with a single layer of objects and add the ability to randomise the depth. To be honest, it's a pretty straightforward 2D array, but there's one significant difference. We'll be using the depth of the shelf to define the x-axis of the array, not the length of the shelf, as would seem more logical. Why we do this becomes more apparent as we create the style. So first of all, draw a spline for the depth of your shelf, and then draw a second spline for the length of the shelf. Something to note, for A2S generators, the array's height is measured along the y-axis. So draw the spline in the top or perspective view along the y-axis and then rotate it into the correct position to make it easier to visualise. With that done, create a new rail clone object and open the style editor. Add a new A2S generator. This will be used to create the two-dimensional array required to populate the shelf with objects along its length and its depth. Create two new spline nodes Create one to the X spline input and the other to the Y spline input and now pick the shelf's depth path for the X spline and the length path for the Y. The reason for doing it this way round is to be able to add variation to the number of objects in depth. You see, to create the gaps we're going to randomise the size of a null segment at the border of the array. And here's the problem, if you randomise the height of a segment in the top input, the top border, the rows below get clipped in the same place, determined by the size of the largest segment found in the top row. This is because the A2S generator is essentially a stack of one-dimensional arrays. Each row is calculated independently and the height of each row is determined by its largest segment. What this does mean though is that a segment placed in the left or the right input can be used to clip the default segments a random distance from the edge of the array. And armed with this understanding, it's a simple case to rotate the array to move the left and the right sides to the front and the back of the shelf, simply by swapping the X and the Y splines. And you may also need to reverse the Y spline to change the direction of the array. So we now have the randomised side segment for the back of the shelf where it can be used to control the number of objects that are placed in depth. And if we go back to our style, 
We'll continue by creating three new segment nodes and picking the three products from the scene. We never want this geometry to be cut or bent to follow the path, so for each segment go to the Properties Deform option and turn off Slice and Deform. Wire these three segments to a new sequence operator and then wire this to the generator's default input. Using these you can control how many times a product is repeated using the sequence operator's counter parameters. These allow you to create the groups of products we mentioned in the introduction. To control and randomize the rotation of the products, we can add a new transform operator between the sequence and the generator. Go to the transform operator's properties and enable random rotation. Enter minimum and maximum values to get the desired look. In this case, to turn the items towards the front of the shelf and get some random rotation, I used a minimum value of minus 80% and a maximum value of minus 100%. Finally, to randomize the number of objects distributed in depth, create a new transform operator and wire it to the right input. Create a new segment node and wire it to the transform operator. We won't be using any geometry for this segment, it's just to add spaces. Right click on the transform operator, select export parameters and choose X size and then click OK. Go to the nodes properties and make sure fixed sides is enabled or you won't see any updates. And finally, add a new random number node and wire it to the newly exposed X size property. Change the type to scene units and set a minimum and a maximum value to get the desired effect. And that's the style complete. Here's how the final graph looks. And as you can see, you can adjust these properties to change the depth and the grouping of these objects. The previous technique works really well if you only need a two dimensional array of objects. But what if you also need products to be stacked on top of one another? There isn't a three-dimensional array in Rail Clone, so we have to resort to some tricks. The first is using nested arrays, which involves using one Rail Clone object as a segment inside a second. Here's how that works. Create two splines, one to define the depth of the shelf created in the top or perspective view, and a second to define the height created from the front or a side orthographic view. Create a new Rail Clone object and open the style editor and create a new A2S array. Create a new spline node and select the height spline we created earlier. Wire it to the Y spline input. Create a segment node and wire it to the default input. Select an item from the scene and disable slice and bend. Because this is an A2S array turned on its side, the orientation of the segments won't be correct. So to fix this, go to their transform tab and enter a value of minus 90 degrees for Y fixed rotation. Add some randomization too by enabling rotation randomization and adjusting the minimum and maximum values of the X axis to minus 80 and minus 110. To randomize the depth, we'll use the same trick as the previous example. So to recap, we create a new transform operator and wire it to the right input. Then create a new segment node and wire it to the transform operator. Then right click on the transform operator, select export parameters choose X size and then click OK and then go to the nodes properties and make sure you enable fixed size to turn that feature on. Then add a random number node and wire it to the X size property. Change the type to scene units and set the minimum and the maximum values to get the desired effect. So this is one of the products complete but we have three. So simply duplicate this whole object and swap the geometry to create styles for the other three types. Now if you want to move the rail clone object away from the spline so that they're not all on top of one another, turn on free object from the style rollout. This will allow you to move it freely. Then when you're done, all of your products should be controlled by the same two splines that determine the shelf's height and its depth. So the last thing we need to do is to distribute these also along the shelf's length. And to do that we'll create another rail clone object and then open the style editor and this time we'll add a linear L1S generator. Now create a segment node for each one of the rail clone objects we just created and pick them from the scene. Once again we want to disable bend and slice. Then create a new sequence operator and wire it to the default input. Connect all the segments and set the number of desired repetitions using those counter parameters. And then finally, the default behavior here is to center the segments to the spline on the Y axis. Well, we want to align our products to the front of the shelf. So go to the segments alignment options and for each one, change the Y alignment to bottom.
and you'll now have a three-dimensional array that's controlled by three splines. The height and the depth splines control rail clone objects that are nested inside a final style with a third spline to control the shelf's length. In terms of instancing, this is slightly less efficient than the first example because only the final rail clone object is instanced. The nested rail clone objects are treated as though they are static geometry. Another issue is the lack of randomization. Each time the nested object is repeated, it's identical. It is possible though to randomize the nested object each time it's used, which will provide much more natural variation. And to do this, you just enable the nest option in the segments to form settings. A word of caution though, this completely disables instancing, so it's best used for low poly source objects or for smaller arrays. The final option we'll demonstrate in this tutorial is to use a pre-built macro. This technique is able to create a three-dimensional array, just like we just showed in the nesting section, but it retains full instancing and allows you to use randomization. The best part is you don't have to learn how to set up a complex graph. We've done the hard work for you and packaged it up into a single node that's easy to understand and quick to use. So what are macros? Well, they're graph snippets that can be represented as a single node. Any numeric node contained in a macro is exposed in the properties panel, making it possible to simplify graphs and create completely new and flexible operators for rail clone. Macros can also be shared in two ways. They can be saved as external files to be shared with colleagues or online, or we can add them to the built-in macros library, which can be updated automatically using Update Manager. In that way, we're able to extend the feature set of RailClone at any time. In this example, we'll import a macro from the downloads of this tutorial. So draw a spline to define the length of the shelf, create a new RailClone object, and open the style editor. Create an L1S array and wire a spline object to the generator spline input, and then pick the spline from the scene. Then, create a new macro node. Right click on it and select macro load from. And then navigate to the 10 by 10 zstacker.rcm file, select it and click open. Once the file is loaded, you'll see that all the parameters of the macro show up in the properties panel. So let's use it. Wire this macro to the generator's default input. Then to add the geometry, wire a new sequence operator to the macro's input. Create segment nodes and pick the objects from the scene. Remember to disable bend and slice for each of them to make it more memory efficient. Attach the segments to the sequence operator and that's more or less it. The macro takes care of nearly everything else. So you can, for example, adjust the minimum and the maximum height to control ra the randomization of stacked products. Or if you want to, you can set the parameters to the same value so that there's no randomization. You can also adjust the minimum and the maximum depth to control depth of the shelf and add randomization to the number of products that are added. We have a third parameter here called random rows that allows you to remove some objects from the front of the shelf as though customers had bought a few. The higher the value, the more products are removed. And finally, you can add some variation using the rotation minimum and maximum values. To control the grouping of products, use the sequence counter parameters just like the previous examples. Or if you prefer, you could also try using a random operator or even a selector operator to control placement using material IDs that are applied to the spline. If you want to create multiple shelves, just select the spline object and clone the spline subobject. As you can see, this macro is easy to use and involves really very little setup. It does have a hard-coded limit of 10 objects high by 10 deep, but if you need more, we could add larger versions. Just let us know. This macro will be added to the built-in library, available in the stacking category. There will also be a second macro available that stacks objects on the y-axis. This can be used in conjunction with the A2S generator to create multiple evenly spaced shelves easily. Using it's relatively simple. Just drag the macro from the library to the construction view and wire it to the A2S generator's Y evenly and optionally bottom inputs. Then attach geometry and adjust the settings in the usual way. Next, you'll need to rotate the A2S generator so that it's upright. Either use the X rotation property or you can use a path wired to the Y spline input. If you're not using a second spline, you'll also need to adjust the height of the array using the Y size parameter.
And then to adjust the spacing between shelves, use the Y evenly distance parameter. And don't forget to disable justify if you need the distances to remain a fixed size. We hope you've enjoyed these techniques and we're sure they have a wide range of applications beyond stacking shelves. And remember too that this tutorial is compatible with the free light version of RailClone, which can also be used for commercial work. Meanwhile, stay tuned for our next tips and tricks instalment and check out our other videos in the tutorials section of the website. If you use these tutorial files or any of the techniques shown in this tutorial for your own projects, we'd love to see them on our forum.